Oh, are you full from all that food? Because if you put this down this sink, even if you have a garbage disposal, your pipes are gonna be full too. And that's gonna lead to sanitary sewer blockages. So you remember, trash it, don't splash it. Good afternoon and welcome to the March 19, 2018 meeting of the Orlando City Council. We're going to begin today's proceedings with the invocation offered by Asharia Ashuk Shukla. I do pretty good on that. Um, he is a priest at the Hindu Society of Central Florida since 2009. Received his schooling in Sampurnan and Sanskrit University in India and has a master's in Sanskrit. His experience and knowledge encompasses all rituals within Hinduism including marriage, birth and death and the making and interpretation of the birth chart. He is well versed in Sanskrit and Adhai and is conversant um, in several languages. 25 years ago Hindus in Orlando met at a Lutheran church and as the Hindu community grew the need for a temple became imperative and in 1982 the Hindu Temple Society of Greater Orlando was formed and in 1987. The society became known as the Hindu Society of Central Florida and in 1995 the Hindu Temple of Central Florida was opened in Castleberry. The invocation will be followed by the Pledge of Allegiance led by Commissioner Ings today. Thank you. Bhadrankarne Bhisranuyanu Deva Bhadram Bakshe Makshavir Jatra Stirai Rangai Tushtava Gungsastanu Bhi Vese Mahi Deva Hitang Yadayu Sastinaha Indra Vridhasrava Sastinaha Pusha Vishwaveda Sastinasta Riksho Varishtane Mihi Sastino Brihaspatir Dadhatu Om Deu Hau Shanti Ranta Riksha Gung Shanti Pritha Vishanti Apaha Shanti Yokshadhaya Shanti Banaspataya Shantir Viswai Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvagung Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redi Om Shanti 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 Om Om The prayer just we did the meaning that uh, <coughs> the five elements earth, fire, uh, water, sky and space you know and uh, they all should be peace and calm they are five elements they representing God on earth 
So we pray through the nature to God that everything should be peace and calm and happy. Everyone should be happy in the world. Everyone should be without sickness and problems. And everyone should enjoy good health, prosperity and happiness. Thank you. Okay, let's call the meeting to order. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll and make a determination of a quorum, please? Commissioner Gray? Here. Commissioner Ortiz? Here. Commissioner Stewart? Here. Commissioner Sheehan? Here. Commissioner Hill? Commissioner Ings? Here. Mayor Dyer? Here. Mayor, you have a quorum. Thank you, Madam Clerk. First order of business we will take up for consideration the minutes of the agenda review and city council meetings sure. of February 26th. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan. Second. Second by Commissioner Ortiz. <laughs> Wait for it. Uh, all those in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. Aye. I mean, all those in favor. Now all those opposed. Aye, aye, aye. Okay, and so the motion carries. All right, that takes us right into um, the mayor's update. And you may have noticed that Commissioner Hill is not with us today. She and Commissioner Ortiz will be joining this group this evening, are traveling to Puerto Rico today, and they will join 32 students from our youth programs who are taking their spring break and volunteering in Puerto Rico to assist the island with the island's Hurricane Maria recovery efforts. I had a chance to wish them well. Um, I can tell you this, three quarters of them have never been on an airplane before, so it is gonna be a life-changing experience for them to go over and do some good deeds for this week. It'll be spring break well spent. This year, the city of Orlando is kicking off Earth Month a little bit early. We're joining 180 countries, and this coming Saturday at 8.30 p.m., we'll be turning off all of the lights at the Lake Eola Fountain and all non-essential lights in city-owned buildings to raise awareness about energy conservation and climate change, and that will be the kickoff of our Earth Month campaign. And then one final thing before I get to the agenda. Uh, next month is Orlando Sound Bites, and it is the city's newest signature event. We try to do four signature events a year, one in each quarter, and this is going to be a free festival on the East Lawn at Lake Yola Park, and it's a combo of Orlando's hip culinary scene and live indie outlaw country music, which guess what genre the mayor likes. That just happens to be it. So we're excited about hosting this uh, event and having the Cadillac along with several other great acts and we will kick off at about five o'clock on Saturday, April 7th. Okay, now on to the agenda and this is a really exciting item and you know that we work hard to incorporate the arts into everything we do as a community and to increase the number and types of cultural offerings that we have and on today's agenda is an agreement that will further those efforts by um, specifically uh, enhancing the Manila Museum of American Art and thanks to a very very generous gift from Michael Manello in honor of Marilyn Manello the museum will add several world-renowned American works of art to greatly enhance the collection that is already contained there including 14 paintings and five sculptures permanently gifted and additional 20 works that are loaned on a long-term basis and the donation also includes two legacy gifts including a million dollar gift and annual fundraise funding commitments from Mr. Manello's foundation and on behalf of the city of Orlando I would like to thank Mr. Manello who is here with us today Michael your countless contributions um, were certainly recognized at the gala that we had um, a couple of weeks ago very fitting tribute and we thank you for entrusting the city to continue your legacy and passion for the arts and cultures. Orlando wouldn't be the city that it is and would not have the rich cultural heritage that we had without your and Maryland's influence and enthusiasm for the arts. And I'd like to, add, I'm going to stand and I'd like everybody to stand and let's show our appreciation to Michael and I would love for you to say a few words.
well, it's wonderful to, to collect art, and it's wonderful to be part of that society. But what is so rewarding is the hunt. You go after these wonderful paintings, and I really did a lot of research before buying them, but it was an, a wonderful journey. It was so, so fabulous that, and that's why we have, but I'm so happy that I gave them to the city so that they can enjoy them and all the people around them. It's so wonderful that, that I was able to do that and I give it with all my heart. Marilyn and I have always been very, very favorites of, of, of the uh, Orlando and we just love all of you and we thank you for being our friends. You're really great, wonderful people. And of course, I've known Commissioner Stewart for years too, haven't you? You're old as I am or younger. <laughs> <laughs> so anyhow, it's, it's wonderful. So I, uh, I thank all of you for recognizing, but I, it's my pleasure to do what I did. Happy to do this. I, I hope other people will follow my steps. They really should. Well, I guess I talked long enough, didn't I? <laughs> <laughs> it's great. Would all the, the uh, members of the Friends of the Manila stand as well? Let's give all of you guys. Thank you. Two other things that I would like to highlight. Uh, we have been working with Ability Housing to bring new affordable units uh, along Mercy Drive. And on our agenda today are the final changes for a purchase sale agreement related to uh, property that will be going to Ability Housing. When we complete that, uh, there will be the opportunity for 166 new multi-house units um, and also uh, the opportunity for permanent supportive housing. Shannon Nasworth, President and CEO of Ability Housing, is here with us today. Would you stand and let us thank you as well? There you are. And the other item that I want to mention is uh, our bike infrastructure. We are um, working to develop and implement our bicycle plan. Um, we've been working on it since 2008, but we want to be one of the most bikeable cities in the entire United States. So there's an agenda item related to that today. And the last thing before I go on to the consent agenda, are there students here today? If you would, would you please stand? Any students from Valencia or UCF? Yeah, as Commissioner Stewart's commenting, they, they could be at the beach today or anywhere, but instead they're here at Orlando City Council, and I can't think of a better place to be on a beautiful Monday afternoon. With that, we're going to go on to the consent agenda, and the consent agenda is a number of items that are acted upon through a single vote of council. We give each of our commission members an opportunity to comment on items from the consent agenda and update you on important happenings from their individual districts and we rotate the order we do that and today Commissioner Rings is first up. Commissioner. Thank you Mayor. I'd just like to uh, start off by saying thank you Mr. Manello for your contribution to the City of Orlando and also the Central Florida region because this is a great uh, a donation that you have done and, and with the expansion of the uh, center itself uh, it's going to be great for the region. And Shannon Fitzgerald, thank you so very much for all of your help uh, and your letting me know what was happening and, and, and bringing everything to my attention so that I was aware of what was going on. And this is truly a wonderful thing uh, for us. And thank you, Mayor, for having everybody to just stand up and give Mr. Manello a round of applause because it's truly, and you spoke of it, Mr. Manello, it's truly about a big heart. And your big heart for Orlando is just really great, outstanding, and this is a historic event that we have witnessed here today. So I'm happy to be a part of that. And Shannon, you did wear red. <laughs> um, also, this past Saturday, I attended the National League of Cities 
uh, about a week ago Saturday, a uh, Congressional <coughs> City Conference that was held in Washington, D.C., and uh, returned back to Orlando on that Tuesday, March the 13th. But uh, each, each time with the uh, National League of Cities, we have great opportunities to learn more and see different things that are happening throughout uh, the United States and specifically in Washington, D.C., and to be able to lobby and speak with our local um, federal elected officials. Uh, and then on Wednesday, March 14th, uh, Mayor Dyer and Orange County Mayor uh, Teresa Jacobs, uh, they had standing in solidarity ceremony. And this was held at the Dr. Phillips for the Performing Arts Center in the Green Lawn. And this was in support of the victims, their families, and more specifically, the students, too of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School uh, in reference to the shooting at Parkland, Florida. So again, thank you, Mayor Dyer, for that wonderful event, and it meant so much to uh, all of us uh, in the area. And then on Thursday, March 13th, I attended and brought greetings at the Onyx Women on the Move Awards Luncheon that was held at the Alphon Inn Hotel in Winter Park, Florida. Uh, Richard. Rich Black, uh, who is the head of Onyx. Thank you so very much for all that you do and have done for the community. Uh, there were several notable women that were recognized, and with March being uh, uh, National History Month for women, this was a great time and a great opportunity. And I also like to mention, too, that Commissioner Regina Hill and, and uh, Marcia Hope Goodwin and uh, Brenda March, all of the city of Orlando were uh, recipients of this Women on the Move Awards for 2018. I also attended a Millennia Park Neighborhood Watch meeting on Thursday, March 15th as well. Uh, what's significant about this is the whole entire uh, resident community uh, within Millennia Park are very well organized. And um, they were concerned about lighting issues at night and also about crime, uh, where people come into the neighborhood and commit crimes. But the one thing that um, Officer Landon Thomas was able to show them and tell them that crime in their neighborhood was down because of their very involvement in calling in about suspicious persons. So that really made a difference in our meeting. We had. Uh, city employees OUC that were on hand. We took a walk in the dark to see what it's like in the back of a uh, community. And obviously it, it meant a lot to us to really see this and see what the people were dealing with. Some homeowners did uh, uh, modify their homes to put in some new lighting, which really helped uh, the situation. So we've got much much more to do with Millennia Park, but I'm so happy to see that the residents there are very engaged. And then I attended the 2018 Orlando Magic Youth Foundation uh, Black Tie and Tennis Shoes Gala that was held at the Amway Center. Uh, Mr. Rich DeVos was there and Alex Martins, president of uh, the Magic. I was at the table with Arthur Lee and Lee and Lee Levy and Lee Wesley a table. So this was a great event, a great fundraising event each year that the Magic does. And they really give to a lot of the uh, nonprofit organizations right in our area from the funds that they actually raise. Well, coming up uh, this Saturday, March 24th, is uh, District 6 annual Easter Excellent celebration and egg hunt and that will be held at the dr james r smith center at 1723 bruton boulevard in orlando and it will be from 10 a.m until 1 p.m so we'll be giving out some easter baskets um, and eggs and uh, of course some candy but we will feed the kids as well because we want them to know that we do care about them and we want them to be safe in everything that they do uh, coming up Wednesday, March 21st, is an Easter cantata at 7 p.m., and that will be at Calvary, Orlando, at 1199 Clay Street in Winter Park. Uh, 
You can call to reserve your ticket at 407-900-3442. This is a free event, and this is basically a um, Korean choir uh, that will be singing and performing, and, and they do an excellent job, and especially with their Christmas cantata. And then Saturday, March 31st, He Paid It All, an Easter production presented by Standing Ovation Talent Group with Miss Terry Burns. Uh, she's the director. It will be held at 4 p.m. at the Dr. Phillips Center for the Performing Arts uh, at the Alexis and Jim Pugh Theater, uh, right across the street from uh, Orlando City Hall. This is a great event because this is a local organization that bring in local kids, teaching them dance and teaching them uh, the art of performance uh, before crowds. And families are there to support them and everything. So I'm encouraging all of us that have an opportunity to come and purchase your tickets. They're almost sold out, which is really great. But purchase your tickets to attend and support some of our local kids. And that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll move to District 1, Commissioner Gray. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also would like to echo Commissioner Ng's comments to Mr. Manello and your wife and family and the friends. Thank you very much for the contribution. And uh, we will pledge to be good custodians of this artwork. So thank you very much for your generosity. Second thing I'd like to mention is <clears throat> I had the good pleasure uh, a week ago of attending the Lake Nona Impact Forum, which if you haven't heard is put on by Tavistock and the Lake Nona Development Group. But what's interesting is every year they host uh, this forum, bring in folks from the medical community, researchers, practitioners, uh, folks involved in the medical field <clears throat> to uh, have a meeting of the minds. And what was important to me and, and, and dawned on me sitting in an auditorium full of very intelligent people, of which I was not one, um, the, the, the impact certainly of the efforts in the medical field to fix those things that are uh, that, that cause us ailments, but more importantly, the amount of effort the medical community is putting to preventive medicine, wellness, etc. Um, and uh, a big discussion on the opioid crisis we have, etc. But uh, that, that was impressive, but on top of that, uh, it, it, I want to thank the Tavistock Group for hosting this. It's an expensive event, but they bring folks throughout the world. Uh, for a two and a half day summit and the important part for us I think uh, in Central Florida is not only does it showcase Orlando but all of Central Florida to folks throughout the world that don't really know the other half that we talk about of Orlando and it's a great showcase and so I was impressed I just want to thank them because it is uh, somewhat self-serving for them we know that but at the same time it's an expensive and time-consuming undertaking so thank them um, what I would say about the agenda I have one item it's a little bit premature because we haven't got to the ordinances but I'm going to declare a conflict on number three ordinance first read which is 2018-20. It's rezoning of some property in uh, North Bumby Ave, and I have a business relationship with one of the sponsors. So I will do the paperwork, Mayor, and have that filled in. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll move to Commissioner Ortiz. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> I'm going to have to hold this, this thing. Well, yeah. <laughs> that's going to be fun. Uh, but once again, I want to echo the words of my fellow commissioners. Mr. Manello, thank you for your legacy. That's something that uh, generations to come will enjoy. And what a better legacy than something like that, right? Art. So thank you so very much. Um, I want to thank you. Let's talk about academics, because that's a subject that I really like a lot. And we have an academy. The mayor has a great academy by the city of Orlando. And I know we, it just happened. It was a very successful one. In a parallel kind of way, we're doing our government academy. And we just had uh, our assistant or chief assistant city attorney Kyle Shepard teaching on state government and it was very successful I want to thank you Kyle for such a wonderful class and uh, students and the community really thank you for that I want to congratulate Miss Alex Temes which was the one who originated this particular trip to Puerto Rico a great initiative you know so many times we take our kids to Washington to New York and all these places hey we have that little island called Puerto Rico which has a lot to offer even though it went through some turmoil but it still has a lot to offer and I'm pretty sure these kids are going to enjoy the uh, the trip very much so and they're going to learn a lot about Puerto Rico in terms of the academic side of it and uh, government so I'm looking forward to meet with them tonight. Uh, 
I also want to thank my aide, Lauri Campos, which is, did a terrific job putting this trip together and continues to be in communication with, uh, with Alex from Puerto Rico to make sure that everything goes smooth in Puerto Rico. So, uh, shout out to Lauri and thank you for the great job you're doing. And last but not least, Mr. John Perron. We just came back from the Dominican Republic once again, trying to help our fellow countries around here. Dominican Republic, they are trying to revitalize their national park at the capital. And Mr. John Perron and his expertise was of great help. We just got back from that trip and they were very, very impressed by his knowledge and by his doing so. I'm pretty sure they're going to be consulting. City of Orlando, as I always say, the epicenter of the world. We have it all, right? We just got to continue. Thank you, Mayor, for this opportunity. Thank you, Commissioner. We'll move to Commissioner Stewart. Thank you, Mayor. And uh, Michael, again, thank you for uh, allowing us to be stewards of your gift. Um, it means a lot to us, and we appreciate that. Um, it's an incredible vote of confidence, and we, well, we're going to take good care of it, I promise you. Um, uh, Shannon, thank you for your work and your leadership, and of course, the rest of the friends, thank you all for what you do and what it means to our community. Um, uh, it's, uh, when you look at art, you have to look at it through your grandchildren's eyes. Uh, and so, as you do, uh, it, it has a different kind of meaning, and I appreciate it. So, thank you very much. Uh, let me just cover, cover a couple, three or four things, and a few items on the agenda. Uh, this weekend, March 24th, uh, the um, main annual Mexican Food Festival will be held in Orlando over at Gaston Edwards Park in District 3, uh, over along North Orange Avenue. Uh, it's the first time they've moved it out of the consulate, and we're excited about about that going on so please come join us it'll be uh, traditional mexican food tastings and cocktails and more uh, there's a small fee but please come join us it'll be a lot of fun uh, on Saturday, March 31st, the College Park Neighborhood Association is hosting their annual Easter egg hunt over in Albert Park. And then uh, that's on 9 o'clock in the morning. At 10 o'clock that same morning, the Orlando Fire Department is hosting theirs over at the Orlando Fire Museum. So I want to say uh, thank you to them and also encourage our community to come out. It's a great time for community building. Uh, on Saturday, April 7th, um, from 1 to 5, the Audubon Park Garden District is hosting their garden tour. Uh, so it's a new opportunity to go and visit houses that have gardens, both um, uh, sustainable gardens, uh, farmlets, uh, tropical gems, flower gardens, a chance to be around that community and highlight our Audubon Park Garden District. So you get a chance to please come join us. Uh, three items on the agenda I want to touch on very briefly. Uh, one is item B6, Fire Station 9 is now finally getting towards we're having construction and uh, that we're approving that today. I appreciate that. I think it will be a great asset over there in that community. Um, uh, item I-1 is a Department of Corrections uh, agreement that we have to do our public work support and our landscaping and the work that we do in our right of ways. Thank you very much to Rick Howard and the work that you did to accomplish that. And then, of course, uh, I'm, I'm honored to support uh, item G1, our agreement with the Manila Museum, and the extension of that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mayor. That's all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. And uh, let's go to Commissioner Sheehan. Well, thank you, Mayor Dyer. When your phone was quack, and I thought Chapita the Swan had gotten loose in City Hall, I was really freaking out. That phone sounds exactly like Chapita. If you all have ever seen Chapita at the Swan at Lake Yola Park, if you haven't met her, you're lucky. <laughs> She'll attack you. So. Um, uh, on the agenda today, I had a couple of cool items on item C16, a facade grant for an iconic building on the corner of Bumby and Robinson. I love seeing old buildings reused, and this kind of reminds me of the Boulevard of Broken Dreams. It's like an old, old facade, and we're actually going to, the, um, the owner is actually going to be redoing that. So I'm delighted to see us using facade grants to save old buildings. That's, that's number C16. Um, on item D4, we're delighted to hold, ho host the Boy Scouts at Beardall Center so that we can free up the Lake Lona Dune project. And um, Mr. Manello, um, I have to thank you and Marilyn. I have to tell you, when I first got here, I, I loved Mar Marilyn Man Manello. And uh, she knew how to throw a party. We used to have the most boring parties at City Hall, okay? And Marilyn knew how to throw a party. And we always have lemonade and punch. And Marilyn was like, no, where's the wine? <laughs> You have to have a wine if you're going to have a party. And she was just so much fun and loved to have a party. And I miss her and I miss that spirit, but she left that with us because ever since you brought that fun spirit to our art gatherings, everybody does it now. And, and that's a lasting gift of Marilyn in addition to you know, teaching us how to have fun with art 
in addition to this amazing gift of this art collection, I mean, I was an art history, um, I was an art major, and we studied a lot of art history, and many of these paintings that you are donating to us are very important works of art, and I have to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. And something that's very, very important when someone gifts art to a city is that sometimes when we fall upon bad times, um, we make bad decisions as elected leaders and sell those. That cannot happen to this collection, and I'm really glad to hear that, and I think that's something that we need to think about when people gift art to cities and states that we make sure they're protected because it shouldn't fall upon the donation to, to make up bad financial decisions that municipalities or whatever make and I'm delighted to, to know that we're protecting that art we're going to be able to enjoy that art and I consider the Manila Museum of Art one of the gems of our city I walk by it every single day and I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for something that's just so beautiful and so amazing and we'll continue you for many years to come. Thank you, Michael. That's all I had, Mayor. You got a motion? Uh, we'll make a motion to, to, to <laughs> find the consent agenda. Yeah, that's kind of second. important, isn't it? <laughs> motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And so the motion carries. All right. We're going to take just about a two-minute recess to allow anyone that was just here for consent agenda that doesn't want to stay for the rest of the meeting an opportunity to slip out. <laughs> Okay, let's reconvene the city council meeting um, and then immediately recess the city council meeting to convene the CRA. And the CRA is, uh, let's see, all we have is meeting minutes. So is there a motion to accept the advisory committee meeting minutes from the 24th of January? Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Second is approving the CRA minutes from February the 12th. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Stewart, second by Commissioner Sheehan. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. And then number three is approving the CRA minutes from February the 26th. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, and so the motion carries. Thomas, any further business to come before the CRA? There is none, so we will adjourn the CRA, reconvene the city council meeting without objection. So that brings us to new business. And the first item on new business is consideration of an appeal in regard to the Lou Garden Stormwater Improvement Project, IFB 18-0057. The appellant in this case is J. Malever, Malever Construction Company. And what we're going to do is we will begin with background from our city's chief procurement officer, David Billingsley. He'll have 10 minutes to present the city side. Then the appellant, the Malever Construction Company, will have 10 minutes. Other interested parties, the low bid, Gregory Construction, will have 10 minutes. Staff uh, will then respond to any questions or that have been, that have come up. We'll have uh, an opportunity for anyone from the public, questions related to the parties, commissioner comments, and then we'll uh, decide the case. With that, David, where are you? There you are.
So good afternoon, Mayor and Commissioners. Uh, my name is David Billingsley. I'm the city's chief procurement officer. Uh, before we get started, I would uh, the city would like to reserve two minutes of our ten uh, for rebuttal. So this procurement is for the drainage and stormwater improvements uh, project uh, that runs along Forest Avenue through Lou Gardens to Lake Rowena. The Procurement and Contracts Division issued an invitation for bid on November 13, 2017. Bids were due on December 14. After an evaluation, the Notice of Intended Action was posted on January 11, indicating that the City intended to award to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Gregory Construction. On January 12, a properly filed protest was received from J. Malover Construction, claiming that the low bidder was not responsive, and we'll address that in a moment. After a review, I uh, issued a written decision denying the protest. That decision was appealed to the Chief Financial Officer, who also denied. And on February 14, J. Malover Construction appealed the decision of the Chief Financial Officer, and that brings us uh, here today. There are two issues on appeal relating to the MWBE documentation provided at the time of bid submittal. Whether Gregory was responsive to the bid documents with respect to the MWBE letter of intent, which was required at bid submittal, and number two, whether the bid specification allowing a bidder an additional five-day time frame to provide MWBE subcontractor participation gives the low bidder an unfair and competitive advantage. So I'll turn it over to Byron Razor that will discuss the MWBE process. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Byron Razor. I'm with the Minority Business Enterprise Blueprint Division. Um, the Minority Business Program has been around since 1983. It was basically created to increase the opportunities for minority and women-owned businesses to participate in procurement with the City of Orlando and also ensure equal contracting opportunity. We currently have about 560 certified MWBE firms, which gives our prime contractors an opportunity to utilize them on various projects. Um, our city ordinance, Chapter 57, basically sets forth um, the MBE program. Uh, our goals for the program are established at 18% minority participation and 6% WBE participation. Um, as a part of our contract documents, we have uh, in the bid solicitation um, section uh, 800, which is our supplementary conditions, section 3, part 2, number 8, basically outlines that the MBE coordinator may provide an extension of no more than five business days when a contractor fails to meet the goals but has sufficient com sufficiently complied with the good faith efforts. Um, after a construction bid is open, uh, our office is responsible for evaluating the MWBE information that includes letter of, letters of intent, good faith documentation. We also valid and verify each minority firm that is either listed on the um, letter of intent or involved in the project. After that, we create a MWBE summary uh, of all the information submitted by all bidders. We then make a recommendation for approval or non-approval of the apparent low bidder. Then we draft the memo uh, to forward to either the project manager or the procurement chief officer. I will now hand it over to Alex uh, Allison. Good afternoon, Mayor and City Commissioners. My name is Allison Brackens. I'm an assistant city attorney here for the city of Orlando. So the first issue on appeal is whether Gregory was deemed a responsive bidder. As required by the solicitation, and is set forth in the supplemental conditions, a letter of intent is to be provided at the time of bid submittal, which lists out the intended contractor's proposed MWBE subcontractors. And evidence of good faith effort shall be submitted at bid opening if the bidder does not meet either or both of the MWBE goals. You'll see on your screen what an example is of our letter of intent that's provided in the bid solicitation. And notably, the first sentence does list that the contractor shall place the following on their letterhead. It lists some other of the requirements, such as listing the percentages, the name of the contractors, and there's also a key um, penalty of perjury area there. Ed, can you switch it to the Elmo? 
So we have up on the screen there the actual provided letter of intent by Gregory Construction. In reviewing their supplied letter of intent, the city evaluated um, the, fo the following and found that it complied with the specification requirements. Namely, they submitted on their firm letterhead. It was submitted at the time of bid submittal. The good faith documentation was attached, which I'm going to Um, the good faith documentation, there was a couple pages, but they, they all look similar to this, where it had the required penalty of perjury language there above the signature line. The fact that the city's exact form was not utilized was deemed to be a minor irregularity, as the form itself did not affect the price. Thus, we determined Gregory and compliance. There is case law that shows that a public body has wide discretion in soliciting and accepting bids for public improvements and its decision when based on an honest exercise of discretion is not generally overturned by the courts. Gregory also submitted a signed and sworn notarized affidavit of present and future compliance with the City of Orlando MWBE ordinance. Which is there on your screen. Thus, Gregory was deemed responsive with the letter of intent and the good faith documentation that was provided at the time of bid submittal. They then were granted an additional five days for review. Ed, you can switch it back off the Elmo, thanks. Which brings us to the second issue, was whether the bid specification allowing a bidder an additional five day time frame to provide the MWBE subcontractor participation gives the low bidder an unfair and competitive advantage. The city evaluated the good faith documentation to substantiate whether Gregory had sufficiently complied with the good faith documentation. The review included some of the following. Um, that they solicited several MBE firms prior to bid opening, that they provided documentation showing that they utilized the city's MWBE directory to solicit subcontractors, that they identified the subcontractors' lines of work that they intended to utilize, and that they demonstrated the portions of the work to be performed by the MBE firms were feasible. Based upon the good faith documentation received, Gregory was given that additional five days extension to ensure that they made a good faith effort to comply with the participation goals. This has consistently been the city's practice with the program over the past 30 years, and all bidders were afforded the same opportunity as set forth in the bid specifications. At the end of this extension of five days, Gregory was able to exceed the city's goals with the overall subcontractor participation of 25.4%. This met the program objectives, and also at no time was the original low bid price changed and did not impact the overall pricing to the city. Additionally, the time to have protested the city's um, procedure regarding the additional five-day time frame would have been seven days after issuance of the bid solicitation per city code. As such, the city believes that the issue is untimely to be heard on this appeal. However, nonetheless, we believe that the city has been fair and consistent in our process of affording the additional time frame if the, if the letter of intent and the good faith documentation is provided at the time of bid submittal. Thus, Gregory substantially complied with the solicitation documents and therefore was deemed a responsive and responsible low bidder. Here before you today, council has the discretion to deny the appeal that has been filed by Jay Malaver Construction and then award the contract to Gregory Construction Inc. Or you have the ability to uphold the appeal that has been filed by Jay Malaver Construction. Or another option is to reject all bids and cancel the solicitation. It's the recommendation of city staff to deny the appeal and in the accompanied new business companion item to award to Gregory Construction. And we'll reserve our further time um, for rebuttal. Okay, are there questions for staff at this point? Then we will uh, move to the appellant, Malibur Construction, and you'll have 10 minutes. Uh, Mayor, Councilman, how are you all today? Uh, Kerry Molliver, Jay Molliver Construction. Um, thank you for uh, listening to us today. Um, we just wanted to say that uh, I've lived in Orlando for 18 years. I live on uh, Bryn Mawr in College Park in the Historic District. We've completed two successful projects for the city, um, the Cherokee to Lake Davis and the Lake Lucerne to Lake Cherokee projects all in good relationships and good standings with the city of Orlando. Um, we do work with the success, the success workforce development program. We've had success with it. 
and we work with the spirit of the program and the contracts and abide by the rules. I'm going to turn everything over to our council, Alex, but thank you again. Good afternoon, Commissioners, Honorable Mayor, Alex Severco on behalf of J. Maliver Construction. I've broken this down into really three pieces of our appeal. First, allowing Gregory to submit their appeal with zero MBEs identified and then going rounding up the MBEs, MWBs after the fact creates a material ad competitive advantage to uh, Gregory in allowing them to bid shop after the fact and basically beat down the subcontractors and the MWBEs that you're hoping to protect by this program and assist in this program. Second, the spirit of the program is clear and almost every contractor does not use what I'll call the Gregory method of saying, well, we're going to try in the future, but they go out ahead of time and they work very hard to obtain bids from MWBEs and put those MWBEs into their, their bid at the time. And what that does is that locks them into using those MWBEs at the time of construction. They can't change. If they change, they have to go through a big process with the Blueprint program, the MWBE program, to change it to uh, a new uh, to a new subcontractor. And then finally, this would set a dangerous precedent, I think, for the city of Orlando and the MBE program, the MWB program, in that it would allow this Gregory method where we say, well, we don't have any, they weren't competitive, but we'll try afterwards. And that's what this would be basically akin to doing, and it would threaten the heart of what you're trying to do with the MWB program and get solicitation and participation up front by allowing people to come in and say, well, I'm trying, but I can't do it right now. And then you get five days to beat the subs and bid shop the subs down to your numbers as opposed to using their numbers, which they feel competitive and able to complete the job at. So those are kind of the three areas that I would uh, point out to you. So the primary tenet of competitive bidding has to do with putting everybody on equal footing. And here, where a bidder deviates from a mere material term of the bid documents, that does not provide an equal footing. In fact, it provides a competitive advantage that those who do not comply get. In this case, there's a letter of intent, which I've, uh, in, in several places, as outlined in my letter, the uh, bidder shall submit at the time of bid opening the letter of intent. I've attached a copy of the letter of intent in my letter, which is Exhibit A. And a couple things to point out again, it says at bid opening this letter of intent it's, should be put on the letterhead and it shall list the minority and women business enterprise percentage that you intend to use and the amounts and then it's under penalties of perjury that you've tried in good faith attempt and this is in fact what you found. Gregory's letter, which is on the next page, and there are several deviations. One, it doesn't identify what any uh, MWB participants they're planning on using. Second, it says here's the areas we're going to look at and we're going to try real hard. Third, it's not under oath, which to me as a lawyer is very, very particular because why would it not be under oath? Why do they not attest under oath that they've tried hard and that these are they found? Now you look at their good faith documentation, it lists that they, as, as put out by the city, it lists several that they contacted, but somehow they got zero response. Every one, zero response. Well, any contractor can make that happen, right? You call, you leave a bland message, hey, call me back. You don't get any response. That's the danger that we're setting with this precedent. We can try, the contractors can reach out, call, they don't get a response, put down zero, submit the bid, submit with their budget numbers, and then they get five days to correct the problem afterwards. That's the dangerous precedent that we're setting here. Also, what does that do? Well, a contractor, and if this precedent is set, will come in afterwards and say, the concrete guy wasn't, uh, wasn't competitive. The uh, pipe guy wasn't competitive. I'm just going to go direct to my source. And based on this reading, there's no requirement to use MWBs. So as long as you save support that they were more competitive, you don't have to use the MBEs at all. You can use all the regular contractors. Once again, that would uh, threaten the exact MWB program that we're providing here. Third, it allows you to develop your budget and then go in and push down on the subcontractors within that five-day period. Say, hey, I've got 20,000 in it for concrete. Here, can you do it for this number? Now, one, I've been awarded the project, so if you come with me, you say, hey, you get the job. Second, uh, if 
they don't, they can say, well, I'm going to go with my more competitive number. You still don't get rejected, right? So the city still accepts your bid. So that goes to the Harry Pepper case, which I've attached for everybody. I don't know how many of you have looked at that, but the Harry Pepper case was uh, the city of Coral Gabriel said use a particular pump. A low bidder came in, did not use that pump. They, they said, okay, well, we'll accept your low bid, but you've got to use the pump we recommend. And the court said, no, you can't do that. That provides you to allow a change after the fact and allows this competitive advantage. Same thing here. The, the MBWEs that are submitted with people like my client, Jay Molliver Construction, who works very hard to go out and get participation up front, <clears throat> they can't change those. But if you get your cake and eat it too, if you do it under the Gregory method where you just submit, we're going to try hard in the future, where they can say afterwards, they say, well, you either win it and you win it at your number, and if you can get the participation, you get it. If you don't get the participation, you then don't get it, or you still get it. So you win, win both ways. It's a win-win situation. So why not follow the Gregory method, try your, a little bit, make it enough for a good faith effort, and then just come in after the fact. Now, that would lead me to the second position, that this is not the spirit of the program, right? The spirit of the program is to get this participation up front, to help build these disadvantaged uh, business enterprises up and, and not come in after the fact and try and negotiate them down. By adopting that principle, the city, in fact, disadvantages them more because, again, go back to the bid shopping where you can come down, you've got the job, you say, MBE, do you want to, MWB, do you want to use, do you want to meet my number or should I just use, you know, the other number? And I think that's not what the program is about and that's not what 99% of the contractors do that bid these jobs. They come in with appropriate upfront, they try their best to beat it. If they can't, they can't, but at least they put a percentage in here. As opposed to, once again, go back to the Gregory method where they say, we're gonna try, we, we couldn't find anybody, nobody called us back, we don't know, we're just gonna give it up. We'll, we'll try later. <clears throat> so finally, that goes to, the, to setting the dangerous precedent with regards to the city program. And again, allowing somebody to come in with zero and giving coming in and changing the MWB program after the fact changing the MWBs and finding these which it's gonna it's gonna set the precedent that that's an appropriate way to bid the city of Orlando jobs and I don't think that's a precedent that we want to be setting in the city of Orlando or the precedent that you want to be sitting that your MWB program can basically be ignored until after you've won the bid. And then you have to do, then you can put in the time, but again, you don't put the labor up front to finding all the MWBs that will participate. And so all that labor is lost to all those other people, except the one who does this Gregory method of saying, we'll find them after the fact, uh, is not lost. So that's a huge competitive advantage. So based on those terms, we would ask that the city reject uh, Gregory as a responsive bidder, that they deviated materially from the um, <clears throat> bid documents, that that material deviation gave them a competitive com advantage, a huge competitive advantage, and that therefore the bid was non-responsive and should be rejected in total. Okay, thank you. Let's hear from Gregory. You'll have 10 minutes, somebody here representing them. Hey, how do I know when 10 minutes is up? I'm, I'll let you know or you're, you'll hear the timer. Okay. What's it sound like? Hold on. Wait 26 seconds. <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon, Mr. If Mayor and Council. Nine minutes, could you let us know so yes. that anybody can do that? Or one minute left? Oh, sure. Okay, thanks. Sure. Um, I wasn't honestly expecting to speak today, but that's okay. Um, I guess I'd like to start off by saying that we, we don't have an attorney with us um, under any circumstances. We probably wouldn't have brought one. But it, it seems pretty obvious. Uh, my name is Andy Gregory, by the way. This is my father, Rich. It seems obvious that, that at, least, at least two departments and several levels of personnel within those departments on the city's side believe that we did at, le at least make our good faith effort and, and solicit when we needed to solicit and do the best that we could. 
the form that you saw on the bid was not the form that that um, was in the bid package my fault yes it is um, I thought that form was a little confusing for the first bid that I submitted with you guys um, but the good faith effort is not it's not that that form the good faith effort happens a long ways before the form um, and that's what I believe the city personnel that reviewed our bid uh, acted upon so they but they have more documentation than just oh I, I made a couple calls or sent a few emails and that's that's what they acted on um, as far as I can tell um, based on the in information I got from the city we followed the specs perhaps not exactly to every letter but we we followed them and I have to think that the inclusion of, of uh, a specification that allows a few extra days to clean some of that stuff up uh, would imply that that particular part of it's not something that a contractor would necessarily be materially non-responsive of it, it, that spec itself which you can argue whether it is or is not unfair it is the spec and it seems to allow for a little bit of a little bit of cleaning up if it's needed um, there's heard you heard words like like beating subs down and bid shopping you need to have evidence of that. I can tell you that it didn't happen. They can tell you that it did. You'd have to find that there's actually evidence that I, I, I said to any sub or any supplier, you need to give me a better price or I'm going someplace else. And uh, if, if you dug, you won't find it. Okay. Thank Thanks very much, much for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks. Staff. I think one thing we need to remember is in the context that the Chapter 57, which sets forth the minority and subcontractor participation goals, it is a goal-based program. And it, the spirit of the program is really intended to maximize the subcontractor participation by our minority and women-owned businesses here in the city. So we set out in our bid documents the procedures for all the bidders to be aware of before they bid and to follow through with. Mr. Um, Sovetko, uh, the attorney for J. Lever, does bring up a standard case called Harry Pepper, which does stand for like a materiality in the bidding that affected the price. When we looked at all the documents that came in on Gregory's contract and the bids package, we looked at them in totality with each other. The letter of intent and the good faith has to be submitted at the time of bid opening. If that letter of intent is showing zero percentage goals or anything under our normal 24% goals, they have to provide that good faith documentation for the city to review and to see if, there, if an appropriate attempt was made to maximize that subcontracting participation. So here, when we looked at the totality of everything together, there was no, um, they were in material compliance. And the form itself does not provide an unfair advantage or sets a different price component. Gennaro. This time I'll have Gennaro Coulter, our MBE Blueprint Division Manager. Good afternoon, Mayor, Commissioners. Thank you for hearing me. I want to hopefully clear this up real quickly. I'm not going to speak conceptually about a program, and I'm going to talk about some of the things that their attorney addressed. We are not setting precedence if you award the contract to Gregory today. The practice that happened in this instance is the practice that has happened for the past 30 years. I need to make you aware of something also. Gregory submitted a good faith form. We didn't just accept their word. Our investigators called up the MBEs and asked them, were you asked to submit a bid? Why didn't you? We only accept the good faith effort if, in fact, we can verify it. And that's always been the practice in any of these jobs that I've had over the last 35 years. What you really need to understand, it's very important that you hear this particular fact. Once they submitted the good faith effort, they could have been awarded the contract without any MBE participation. Once we verified a good faith means you have essentially met the requirement because they did everything within their power to meet it. They did it. The five days that has been our standard of practice allows us to go back to the contractor and say, okay, you met the good faith. We contacted the contractors, they said they didn't want to bid, but we want to push you to try to do more. Gregory went out then, as you heard, and got more than we require. They got 25. Our combined requirement is 24%. The same thing we allow to every contractor. Another piece of information that was forgotten, had we not awarded to Gregory and awarded to Jay Maliver, they would have had to have had, used the same five days 
because in their bid, while they say we're going to use these contractors, we're going to make 24%, they did not say what they were giving to each contractor, so it still didn't meet the intent. The letter of intent, I've done this work again more than 30 years and have been in the city of Cincinnati in California where this matter has gone to court. We don't ask for the form just because we want the letter of intent. We want the information that it provides. In our supplemental conditions, we say you can provide the information on your letterhead. They did that. We had everything that we need and that we have been using to be fair to everybody in ward contracts. You are not setting any different precedents other than the precedents we have been abiding for for the last 30 years in the MD and procurement department as it relates to these matters. Thank you. Okay, any questions of staff? Mayor. Commissioner Stewart. Um, you know, um, do me a favor and give me an example of uh, some of the other similar cases that we've had in the past where this has occurred. Almost, I would have to go upstairs and bring you, but almost in every instance, we get more MBE participation after the bid comes in. Because if they don't get the 18 and 6, they have to give a reason. We only accept the reasons they give if they can verify it. Staff will work in my department if, in fact, and we do check, we do periodic checks of the good faith backup. If they're ever found to be that they didn't verify and they gave it to me to, to be signed, they will be disciplined up and including termination. It's important that you understand good faith is not just as the lawyer conveyed to you that somebody said, I tried to get some MBs and I couldn't and that's it. We actually asked them for the information, who they contacted, and we go back. You can go up in our files and see where Byron, Don, and other investigators have contacted the person and you actually see what that person says. I have gone behind them myself and checked periodically just to make sure the process works. Again, there is no new precedence. This is the practice that's been going on for more than 30 years between the purchasing and the MBE divisions in terms of how we award these contracts. That's our standard Genero, practice. Genero, I know you haven't been here 30 years, but the number of years but you the have records been here, show you. can you tell us that this practice that we have had for 30 years has increased minority and women-owned business yes, participation? Yes, I'm glad you said that. Remind me a point I forgot to tell you. Which is the point of the program, by the way. Right. The point is, if you, when you read our annual report, you will see that we've had an increase in MBE dollars paid, not awards, dollars that MBEs have actually been paid of more than 50%. Our program works very well. And I ask that you not tamper with this particular part of it because it really would hurt the participation that we get for MBEs if we don't go take those five additional days to go back and say, okay, this is what you said you could do, and, you, and if you didn't meet the 24% or the 18 and 6, and you demonstrated good faith, we understand that you did demonstrate good faith, you could really get off, but is this really the best you can do? Why don't you try calling the J. Smith Company? I happen to know that they're looking for work at this time. Okay, further questions? I'm sorry. Yeah, um, let me ask uh, David. I, I know it may be, um, um, since it's all public record now, let me ask this question. Uh, are the is there any evidence that the people that we called told that told Gregory no, but they told Malover yes in the process? In other words, when we call back, I'm assuming that Malover provided, which is they they say they did, a list of who their minority contractors were. And those conversations were done by the MWBE office, so I'll refer that to Byron. Yeah, so in this, in this case, uh, generally, all subcontractors submit their letter of intent forms. So when we're evaluating the low bidder, um, that's when we're contacting them to verify our subcontractors are signing the letter of intent form. But the letter of intent form is signed by the subcontractors and the prime contractor. Yeah, but in this case, in the original submission, the letter was not signed by a subcontractor because they didn't find a subcontractor they could have. Right. So the question is, uh, do we know who the subcontractors were for Malover, and were they the same subcontractor? Did they, was there an attempt made by Gregory to the same companies? You can no. In this case, there were different subcontractors that Jay Malover submitted versus what uh, Gregory Construction submitted. 
but you understand the appearance of this is that, that, that we ask, they said no, we, uh, they asked, they said yes, and all of a sudden now you're stuck in the middle of uh, he said, she said. Do you understand? Yeah, I need to answer that, yes. I understand what you're asking, and no, that's not the case. We have nothing to do with which contractors they, co they contact. We've always been advised, when I say we, in every office I've worked for in every city by the law department, that we cannot recommend specific contractors. We give them the list. It's on them who they contract. We contact. We have nothing to do with whom they contact. That's on the prime contractor or the general contractor. That's in their discretion. We only verify what they tell us that they did. But your list, I'm sorry, this is a small detail, but it's an important detail to me, sure. being a vendor who used to actually deal with the city of Orlando. Um, but your list that was provided, is that list of all the minority, all the approved minority con subcontractors? Yes. yes. Okay. So therefore, by definition, uh, the each one of the vendors would have selected from the same list, is that exactly. correct? So therefore, in effect, somebody told Malibur yes, and they told Gregory no, or they didn't respond to Gregory, is that correct? I can't say it's the same contractors. I don't know who. But you showed a list of contractors. We of give three. a list. We tell them where it is. They but download. But you showed us a list of three pages of contractors in which they got no response on all three pages of contractors. No, they're not required to go to every contractor. That would be an impossible task. But they your contract information you showed us said that they did. Or that they didn't. They contact the ones they're familiar with, the ones they want to contact. We, have, we don't specify you have to contact this contractor and we wouldn't we would never do that almost every instance the contractors contact different subcontractors for whatever reason that's something we will never get into so it's not apples to oranges it's not like there there was 10 contractors that jay maliver contacted and they said yes and then those same 10 contractors were contacted by gregory and they said no it's not apples to apples Essentially, Commissioner, um, when they're when the prime contractors are evaluating the lines of work on the bid items, it's up to them to determine which bid items they're going to utilize subcontractors for. So their due diligence on the firms that they're going to utilize and their lines of work is up to the prime contractor based on what lines of work they actually want to subcontract out. I, I understand. I, 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 I'm looking at it from a business perspective, but let me just repeat myself so make sure they're on the same page. I'm not sure I disagree with how we did it and whether we do it. I'm just I'm looking at the appearance of this. And to me, the appearance is that there is a list of subcontractors in which Gregory said they made an attempt to talk. There were three pages of them. And in those three pages, are any of those people on those three pages, did they respond to Malibur? And are they on Malibur's bid? That's an easy question to ask, and Mr. Malibur is shaking his head. Yeah, I believe the answer is yes to that. Um, there were some firms such as like Suka Pipe and Supply, Jay Maliver, at the time of their bid, they had them on their list. After the additional five days, Gregory was able to work with them to increase their percentage. So yes. Excuse me, Mayor, Commission. It, the, the principle behind this the is your opportunity to respond I'm, I'm right sorry, now. Mayor. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm just asking questions. I'm not trying to debate the question. I'm just making sure. So, Mac, uh, the information, that you, uh, I'm sorry. I, I think I understand the process. I think you didn't give me the answer. <laughs> that, that is an appropriate answer. I understand that there is an intent question. But, I, but in a sense, I think the intent question is to say, look, we tried to get 24 and we got 17. Hey, we'll work a little harder. I think that's what the intent is. Here's a case where there's three pages of phone calls they made to people and they didn't respond to them at all, but they responded to another vendor. And that creates this appearance that one vendor is being given advantage over another vendor because they can now call back after the award and say, I've got the award. That's, that's a mistake. It doesn't work like that. I'm a contractor. I know what, what the specialties and the strengths in my company are. So when I go to do a city bid or any bid, I say, okay, I'm really good at laying pipes, so I'm not going to sub that out. I'm going to sub out digging ditches, for example. That's, that's the contractor's right. We don't get into that. We will never get into that. No city ever does that, whether it's an MBE or a non-MBE. 
how the contractor breaks his work down and who he's going to contact is on him. On us, it's only that we verify that what they told us, particularly if they're demonstrating good faith, is that what they told us is the truth. We don't say you have to contact all 300. That's their business. And we don't get into that. And there's a good reason legally, and I'm not the attorney, but Allison can back me up or say I'm mistaken. If we would get into that, if something would go awry, that would be some liability on the city. Plus, Commissioner, the issue of good faith was a determination that was made by staff. The two things that they've challenged is they didn't use the right form. Um, they wrote it in a letter instead of using the form that was provided. And then that our practice that we've been using for 30 years is not appropriate. It's not whether they did good faith or not. I'm not, I'm not sure that we've done anything really wrong. I'm just trying to make sure that the appearance outside of this to some other may appear to be a little bit different. And I'd like to, after we get through this evening or this afternoon, see some evidence of some other locations or other bids that we did that were like this. Because to me it would be important. I've been in the position of both the winning and the losing side to this city 25 and 30 years ago and have had those same kind of issues before. And wouldn't, maybe MB wasn't that big of a deal at the time. But this small, um, trying to go through the, the understanding the, the technicalities of the bid and doing the best I understand it, having a chance to have a good faith opportunity to correct that after a bid. But I am concerned that once the bid becomes public and I'm now the low bidder, there is a distinct advantage I have now to call somebody up and say, hey, you didn't take my call two weeks ago. And now I want you to take my call because I have a chance to win this bid. And that's. And I have to answer that. I really do have to answer that, Commissioner. You would call the directory of MBEs, and I'm not speaking of Jay Malover because I don't know anything about them personally. But if you'd call our directory of MBEs, all of our subcontractors would tell you every contractor does that. Whether they do it be they didn't include them in the bid. They don't even tell them they, they're going to be part of the bid. Our office calls them and tells them that. Sometimes the contractors are coming into City Hall with an MBE getting their price down. I argue with MBEs, why do you do that? And they say, we don't get the work. So I really do have to clear that up. If you call the directory of MBEs in here, our subcontractors, more than 90% would tell you that every contractor does that to them all the time. The only thing I regret about what, where we are today, it does seem to me that Jay Maliver is one of the fairer contractors, but that's the practice of the industry. And they just don't do it to minority businesses. They do it to other subcontractors. That's the nature of the beast of construction. Thank you, Mayor. Ray. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, General Worlds, I'm at mine. I respectfully disagree. I agree with Commissioner Stewart. Once you have a contract that's in your control, you have a better bargaining position than before. But that notwithstanding, my request, I think I've heard enough that it seems to me in this case that the proper protocol of the city was followed. However, I'm not sure we have the proper protocol. So I would like to be part of that meeting with Commissioner Stewart to look at how we do this. The notion that a letter or your, your good faith estimate that we don't absolutely verify that after the fact, after the bid is awarded, I just, I'm not convinced that that's appropriate. We, we verify before the bid is awarded. Yeah, we verify that before the bid, bid is awarded. We verify good faith. We would have never passed on Gregory if we couldn't verify that. Right. Okay, I, I understand. I've heard it all. I, again, I, I respectfully disagree. I think once you have a oh, contract, you have a much better bargaining position because then a sub knows the job is there if they say yes at the, at the terms they're willing to accept. But please just include me in that. Sure. But for this no case, I, I do agree. No like it or not, I think the proper protocol was followed. Uh, even though maybe it, it does seem a, a bit awkward, I, it, it feels like it was was doing that. So, uh, if someone else wants to say, or are we ready for a motion? Well, I'd, I'd okay, like, go ahead. I'd, li I'd like to say something. Um, M Maliver has done wonderful work in my district, and I appreciate that because I've had some real problems with some of these um, construction pro you know projects have gone that have gone way over budget and way over time. So I appreciate their efforts, but. Um, the reason we have this, I, I guess I'm coming up from a different standpoint because I'm a woman 
and I, I appreciate the MWBE program and how it has, has assisted minorities. The five-day grace period is to increase minority women's business you know, enterprise participation. It's not to not to bring it down. And I understand why there might be some some concern from someone who might not understand that that sensitivity. But I want women and minority businesses to get contracts, and I want them to be included. And if we and if we as part of this program, we allow a five day grace period to increase that. I think that's good for minority and women businesses, and I support that. So I'm not in favor of getting rid of that five day grace period if it is allowing more opportunity for people who aren't being given opportunity, which I believe that's what it was designed for. I think we're trying to make a fairness thing out of this to, to denigrate minority women businesses, and I'm not going to stand for it. That's enough, Mayor. Look, I, I'm not going to sit here and be chastised about an attempt for us to have minorities and to, and to have the implication I'm not in favor of a minority program. That's simply wrong. My brother wrote the minority program 30 years ago. I care deeply about it. My concern is the appearance of other vendors coming in and looking from the outside. Uh, I think that we have a process, and I'm going to support staff in this process, but I think that we have to create a better job in the appearance of where we're doing, because not only do we have to do it by letter, right by the letter of law, we have to do it by, by the appearance of it as well. And those are the two issues that I have a concern on. If I could, um, I'm going to jump in this one too. Nobody is suggesting we shouldn't have a very strong MWB program. Nobody's suggesting that. But like every program in the city, if you take a fresh look at it and you come out of that fresh look that it is a strong program, then you've just confirmed what you're doing is absolutely right. And if it's not, we'll make an improvement or two. So th this isn't a, that it's a bad program. Can we make it better? Let's take a look and see. And if we can't, then we know we've, we, we've had a, a good one to begin with. I, I, don't, I don't see it's any kind of affront on, on the program. We're just trying to make sure it's fair, reasonable, and to the benefit of everybody. That's okay, all. Okay. I think what we have devolved into is a policy discussion rather than a pellet procedure. And the, um, as I see it, um, there were two issues before us. and. We can debate whether we ought to have a practice or policy that allows for five days afterwards, but that has been our practice for 30 years, so I don't think we can change that in the midst of an appellate process. Is there a motion of some sort here? Your choices are to deny the appeal, to, oh, you know what, actually, is there anyone from the public that would like to testify that is not, has not already testified? All right, then I'll close that part. Commissioner, comments? One quick rebuttal. Nope. Okay. We are on Commissioner Sheehan. Do you have a motion to deny the appeal? I have a motion to deny the appeal and award to Gregory. Second. Motion is second. Discussion among commissioners? Mayor, I think that's, uh, that's actually two motions, I believe. So I think one, we want to deny the appeal, and the next motion would be then to the award to or the degree actually warning. in this case you're right commissioner stewart it's a motion to deny the appeal and then the next item of business is to award the contract so we will just separate the two motions okay mm -hmm. okay discussion here none all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye aye, aye. aye. as opposed okay commissioner sheehan you got a motion we we'll actually have a second item of business which is the award of contract for lou garden stormwater improvement to gregory construction so moved Motion second. Discussion hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so. Yes. Okay. Do you guys want to rehash this? I have speaker forms from Mr. Malever and Mr. Uh, Servico. On the second motion. Sorry, can you repeat the question? <laughs> I apologize. No, no, I have speaker request cards from Mr. Malever and Mr. Oh. Servico. This is on the award, oh. the second item. On the well, second one. It's supposed one. to be on the first item, but I, I, I guess it wasn't clear. Well, when we, when we you, do you want to speak again? This is now on the award. Yes, I think that one thing would allow um, 
to award this would, once again, set the precedence that anybody can come in with no MBEs and uh, zero MBEs and say they weren't competitive and therefore beat out all the, be the low bidder. And that therefore, Gregory Your better argument be at this bidder. point is that we've been doing it wrong for 30 years <laughs> and that we should consider changing, allowing anybody to pick up any w MBEs that weren't in their original submission. I, I didn't say you wouldn't want to allow people to do the five days. That is not the intent. The intent is to come in with zero. And, and what I heard from the city today and what I've heard before is that you can, in fact, come in with zero MBEs as long as you can show that they're not competitive. You can go with zero MEs, and that's how contractors, that's the precedent you should award. That's the, that's the precedent that contractors are going to follow, and I can now advise my client, come in with zero MBEs, show that they weren't competitive, and go for the low bid. And that's, that's the result of the program. Well, we might change it where you can't get any new WMBEs after this. But well, we don't want that. We don't want that. I mean, Commissioner, we, we want to know that when we submitted our bid, we submitted our percentages and we listed every WMBE, MBE on the proper form to meet the proper qualifications up front. And then we have 24, we have 48 hours or two days to return those contracts to the city. And that's been the process and the procedures and the spirit of the contract. We do not go back out and it protects the reshop of the minority contractors. They are all there on the list for this for the contractors to review and we we submit to them they give us their bids and then when we bid to the city and that's where the real critical thing is when we submit our bid we submit with the minority contractors with their number and we put it in ink the number the percentages and the amount we do not go back and shop numbers change numbers or change MBEs or WMBEs without permission and acknowledgement from the department. We have never done that. That is not the spirit of the contract. That is not how it's meant to be performed. That's not what we're told. That we do exactly as the city has directed us to do. And, and, it, and it works for us. Sometimes it can, it can be headache wise but we work it we work the program and, and it works well but we go in with the proper numbers with the percentages we do not come in after the fact and shop the minority contractors after our number is already submitted and that's our huge argument we were seventeen thousand dollars higher on the bid seventeen thousand dollars higher is all we were higher but our, our minority WMB and MBEs were already chosen. The percentages, they were listed, they were amounted, they were signed, and they were sworn. And that's what you're supposed to do for the city of Orlando. And that's what we did. If I'd have gone in there and said, I can get none, and then I get the number, and I'm low bid, and then I get to go back and go to the minority contractors and shop their number and and beat these guys up, that is not the spirit of the contract. It's not what the city wants us to do. That is not what we have done in the past. Working with the minority contractors is very important with the city. And that's what we have done. And we've proved it twice. That's okay, all I have to thank say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying yep. <laughs> Since everybody thought I was going to Puerto Rico, nobody, I, I didn't get none of the briefings, so this is something that I, <laughs> but I'm a little confused here and I, I've been listening. So this gentleman got all his paperwork and all his contracts done before the actual, I mean, to get ready for the bidding. The second company came over and after the fact went and got the minorities. Is that, is that what I'm listening to? Is this no. what I'm hearing or? Okay. All right. Commissioner, let, let me just see yes. if I can answer this for you. We have a practice that once there is a low bidder and if they have not reached our goals, we give them an opportunity to try to reach that goal and actually work with them to do that. In this case, our staff found that they had complied with a good faith effort on the minority contracting piece, although they had zero. 
okay? So that, I guess, is the issue for everybody, that they had zero to begin with. But by the end of the time, they ended up with 25%. So we can have a policy discussion probably at another time after you guys have had a chance to sit down with Gennaro and the MWE folks to talk about whether that practice is how we want to continue for the next 30 years, but that's the way it's been the last 30 years before any of us were here, and I don't think, I don't know if I even knew that, to tell you the truth. Mary, and if I may ask you, because I think that's part of the bidding process, and, and, and in bidding I believe we have to prepare ourselves, I would highly uh, appreciate if, if the minorities are taken I mean, before, and I understand a low bid coming over and, and us granting them an opportunity to bring more minorities, but if, I also understand that if you really want to comply and you get those minorities before the fact to become more competitive, I think, wouldn't that be a better or more fair way of doing business? I mean, I'm just asking. I, I'm a little confused about the whole thing, but it just makes sense to me that if you prepare yourself and you got all your ducks in a row, then we're punishing you for doing that. No, there's no punishment involved. Either you're the low bid or you're not. And if you're the low bid, have you complied with our procedure? But if the low bid did not include the minorities, which you, they were supposed as part of the elements to the contract, isn't that unfair? If they have not made a good faith effort to comply, yes. But we have staff make a determination of whether they have made a good faith effort or not. I think it's hard for us to make that judgment sitting here it's more appropriate to rely on our staff to make those telephone calls and advise us whether they believe that they in fact made a good faith effort. i guess the next question is what would be a good faith effort well we've had that's been a basis for years and years and years and years in city government what a good faith effort is you want to address that yeah, I was going to address it. You have to remember, it's a threshold question of whether um, they submit at the time of bid, the letter of intent, and good faith effort. The city staff does look to substantiate that good faith effort if they have listed 0% or anything under the 24%. But they have to submit at the time of bid that good faith effort showing. There's a listing in the bid specification documents that lists about 10 to 12 things that you can look at, um, whether other vendors were able to meet the goals, whether on past city projects that the bidder has um, met, met the goals. There's a whole list. Not one is... One is not more exclusive than the other, but there is a way to substantiate, and it was done in this case, but there have been projects in the past where um, bidders have submitted 0% at the time of bid. They haven't submitted the good faith. They have been deemed non-responsive, and we've gone to the second low bid. There's been times when the bidders have um, barely missed the goals, maybe 20%, but they didn't submit the good faith. We have had to jump them. They have. It's a threshold matter at the time of bid to provide that letter of intent and good faith documentation, and then we look at it further to see if it can be substantiated. Did they make the appropriate attempt to reach out to our minority and women business enterprises um, contractors to meet the goals? There, there's a process in place. And Mayor. Commissioner Ings, you've been so patient over there, <laughs> why don't you take a shot? Thank you. And, and, and what I want to say is that specifically, when that bidder has that opportunity, and, and this is talking about the letter of intent, this is talking about a form, and from what I'm hearing is that they did that. As far as the letter was concerned, not necessarily completing the form, but they met that particular criteria, so it wasn't like they had an advantage over anybody else because they were the low bidder. And then the other aspect, too, that I want to also remind council, and that is that when we do look at these MBE uh, solicitations from all of the different companies and our back, backup information and stuff, we'll see that there are some contractors that are different, but they have the same MWBE participation in many of their uh, business opportunities. So it's not just that it's exclusive from the standpoint that, you know, one company uh, doesn't submit anything, and that didn't happen in this case, and that's all that we're here to talk about anyway is concerning that. Now, i love to have a more deeper discussion as it relates with our MWBE program and how we do, because as you know, many times I bring up whether or not there are any MWBE participation involved when we go on piggyback contracts. You know, I just want to make sure that we're doing the right thing and not eliminating or excluding anybody from that particular process. But what I've seen here 
And from what I've read is that everything was done properly. It's just that the poor company, Gregorio, did not do it on the form and submit it on the form, but did it in a letter with his letterhead. And that shows to me that there was some intent to try to do the right thing. I guess we just have to ascertain and, and review the policy to make sure that we have the elements. We can certainly do a workshop on the whole MWB process so that it's not kind of in a vacuum of this one particular issue because the five-day waiting period or five-day additional period is just part of the full overall program. And I don't think we've reviewed that in a while, so we can bring that back for a workshop. And oh, by the way, not that this is going to change anything, but in a former life. I was a supplier in the construction change. I called all the general contractors that I knew were bidding and gave them my price so that everybody would have, whoever won, would have the opportunity to provide, use the product that I was trying to sell. So it doesn't mean that some of the minority, con minority subcontractors can't call the people that are bidding as well. Okay, motion is before us, I think, for, for approval of the award of the contract. Further discussion, hearing none. All in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? And so the motion carries. Okay, want to do anything else? Sure. Yeah. She made the motion. Okay, let's see. That brings us to hearings ordinances, first reading, Madam Clerk. You're up to bat. Number one. An ordinance. Ordinance 2018-18, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, vacating, closing, and abandoning a 14-foot alley of the north side of Agnes Street between Delaney Avenue and Lake Avenue, and comprised of 0 .07 acres of land, more or less, providing for the execution of affecting documents, severability, correction of scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-22, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's adopted growth management plan to change the future land use map designation for a portion of approximately 514 acres of land generally located west and east of State Road 417 and north and south of Lee Vista Boulevard from office medium intensity in part to industrial in part from urban activity center in part to industrial in part and from industrial in part to office low intensity on the city's official future land use maps, amending sub-area policy S.39.4 to revise the development program providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Ortiz. Is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion carries. All right. Hearings, ordinances, second reading, number one. Ordinance 2018-2, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to the City's Growth Management Plan, providing the winter 2017 package of Growth Management Plan amendments pursuant to the expedited state review process, amending future land use sub-area policy S.14.13, amending the boundaries of future land use sub-area 7 and 14, amending the boundary of future land use sub-area policy S.14.14, creating future land use sub-area policies S.13.8 and S.14.17, providing for amendments of the city's growth management plan providing for severability correction scrivener's errors and an effective date so moved motion by commissioner stewart second by commissioner ortiz is there anyone from the public that would like to testify on this matter discussion among commissioners hearing none on favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye aye, aye. those opposed motion carries number two madam clark Ordinance 2018-14, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the Downtown Sports and Entertainment District Plan Development Zoning District to add approximately 0.61 acres of land generally located at the southeast corner of South Division Avenue and West Central Boulevard, providing special land development regulations, providing for amendment of the city's official zoning map, providing for severability, correction of scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and effective date. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Ings. Is there anyone from the public to testify? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-15, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the city's growth management plan to change the future land use map designation for certain land generally located south of West Washington Street, east of North Tet 
Texas Avenue and west of North Dollins Avenue, comprised of 2.86 acres of land, more or less, from industrial to public, recreational and institutional, changing the property zoning designation from general industrial to public use, providing for amendment of the city's official, official future land use and zoning maps, providing for severability, correction of Scribner's errors, permit disclaimer, and an effective date. So Move to adopt. Second. Motion by Commissioner Rain, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone from the public that I can testify? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Those opposed, and so the motion carries. Number, let's see, okay. Ordinances on first read, number one. Ordinance 2018-17, an ordinance of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the Plan Development Zoning District regulations for the Lake Nona Plan Development, generally located north of the Orange Osceola County line, south of Dowden Road, east of Boggy Creek Road, and west of Narcusi Road, and comprised of 6,969 acres, more or less, amending the Plan Development District's development standards and conditions of development, directing amendment of the official zoning map series, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and effective date. Move to approve. Second. <laughs> <laughs> Motion by Commissioner Gray, second by Commissioner Sheehan. Is there anyone for the public by testifying this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. Aye. Number two, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-19, an ordinance of the City of Orlando granting Fomento de Construcciones y Contratas Inc. FCCSA, a non-exclusive franchise to provide roll-off container collection and disposal of solid waste within the City of Orlando, outlining franchisees' duties and providing the terms and conditions under which such franchise shall operate, providing for severability and an effective date. Move to approve. Second. Motion by Commissioner Ng, second by Commissioner Sheehan. It's been a while since we've had a new roll-off franchisee. Um, discussion among commissioners, hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, motion carries. Number three, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-20, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, designating certain land generally located south of Concord Street, west of North Bumby Avenue, east of North Hillside Avenue, and north of Mount Vernon Street, and comprised of 0.42 acres of land, more or less, as the Plan Development District, providing a development plan and special land development regulations of the Plan Development District, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and effective date. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Rings. Commissioner Gray, is this one you wanted to declare conflict it, on? It is in paperwork's file. Okay, thank you. And I'd like to just thank staff for, for working with the two parties to, to come to a conclusion and work this out to the benefit of both. Thank you. Is there anyone who would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. Number four, Madam Clerk. Ordinance 2018-21, an ordinance of the City of Orlando, Florida, relating to disorderly conduct, superseding Chapter 43, Section 43.06 of the Code of the City of Orlando, Florida, prohibiting true threats, providing for severability, providing for codification, correction of scrivener's errors, and effective date. Second. second. Motion by Sh Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. So there's no confusion. At our last meeting, we passed this um, exact order ordinance on an emergency basis which only required one reading so initially I thought we would come back and just do a second reading of that ordinance but since we declared it an emergency um, ordinance staff Kyle thought it was appropriate that we do two readings on this ordinance but the emergency um, ordinance will remain in place during the course of time so we won't be uncovered and Kyle you want to just talk to what the state did uh, during the legislative session and the continued need for this? Uh, sure. Uh, Mayor, you're, you remember that the purpose behind this ordinance was to close what we think is a loophole in existing law that um, left us with no tool to prosecute someone who uh, issued some form of a threat if that threat was in fact sincere. So a true threat. So if someone calls up, say, a, a school and issues a threat and says, hey, you know, look, I was joking, uh, that's something that we can prosecute you for. But there is this loophole whereby um, someone could say, hey, look, I intended to do the actual threat and we had no tools to, um, to prosecute the person. So that's the purpose behind this underlying ordinance. Now, the state legislature was trying to close that loophole and they adopted a bill but we think that it only closes part of the loophole. It closes the part where threats that are true, that are in writing, 
But our ordinance, we think, is still necessary because, of course, the threat could be verbal as opposed to um, um, just in writing. The other thing is, is that the state statute, when they adopted it, it applies to um, mass casualty shootings and terror, um, acts of terror. Um, but there are threats that don't amount to one of those two things that we would like to prosecute you for. For example, if you threaten to, um, um, to, to stab a particular individual, well, that's a, that's a bad thing and we want to be able to prosecute you. But under the state statute, that would not be uh, the case. So we think this ordinance is still necessary. It's not inconsistent with the state law. And um, as the mayor said, we think just um, in an abundance of caution, the ordinance is in effect now on an emergency basis. Um, but just in an abundance of caution, we suggest you go ahead and adopt it through the normal procedure as well. Yeah, mayor. Further discussion, Commissioner Stewart. Um, I'm, uh, I'm a novice at, at the legal side. So tell me how a threat with the intent of not going through and a threat with the intent of going through is different, are different threats. Under state law, there are different things. The, um, your mental state, whether you intend to do something or not, actually matters. We call that the mens rea, the, what your state of mind was. And the way the law works is if, after being confronted with, um, by law enforcement about what you have done, which is um, uttered or posted some sort of threat, um, the current law prior to this legislative session um, only allowed us to prosecute you if it was a hoax. So in other words, if you really intended to follow through with that very bad act, um, then we had nothing that we could prosecute you under. The fear was is that a, um, a disturbed young person would understand that loophole and once confronted by law enforcement to explain that person saying, I, I, I intended to do it. Um, and, in other words, uh, getting a, around the existing law. Commissioner Ortiz. Um, also, there's a couple of elements, and one is the capability. Because if somebody's in Washington State and they threaten with, you know, hitting a school here or something like that, we have to measure the capability of that person being able to accomplish his alleged threat. So. Well, the other thing that comes to mind is um, what's the impact of this on anti bullying? I mean, what the idea is that a, a threat to a person. That that's the loophole that's left, a threat to a person at a school through social media. How does that fall under anti-bullying? Well, under the state statute, there'd be some question about whether their new fix would apply in that situation, but our ordinance would, and so it protects that individual. So um, if a young person named an individual and said, hey, look, I'm going to bring harm on you um, at school tomorrow, the ordinance, the way we've drafted it, um, allows us to um, go and prosecute that individual. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 As opposed, motion carries. All right, and number five. Ordinance 2018-23, an ordinance of the City Council of the City of Orlando, Florida, amending the plan development zoning district regulations for approximately 4.88 acres of land generally located at the northwestern corner of Cole Avenue and West Gore Street, south of Ernestine Street and east of Lucerne Terrace, providing an amended legal description, development plan, and special land development regulations of the plan development district, providing for severability, correction of Scrivener's errors, permit disclaimer, and effective date. Yes. Motion by Commissioner Sheehan, second by Commissioner Stewart. Is there anyone for the public that would like to testify on this matter? Discussion among commissioners. Hearing none, all in favor of the motion indicate so by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, motion carries. And that concludes the official agenda business of the Orlando City Council.
Lake Yola swan boats are incredible. They're huge. Did you know there's almost a mile of walkway around Lake Yola? 